Hello and welcome to the final single day classic of the millennium. I'm Phil Liggett, joined as always by Paul Schoen and this the 93rd Tour of Lombardy in northern Italy. And for those of you that know your Italy, well, those red tiled roofs say it all. The race, 262 kilometers or 145 miles. It takes the riders on a route similar to last year, beginning in Beresi and then ending in Bergamo. And it's a long way and passes through the provinces of Como, Lecco and Bergamo itself. A look back first at the early miles after an opening hour, a set of 43 kilometers an hour, Paul, an attack coming from these two riders, Barbaro and the new world champion Oscar Freer, this on the climb of Selvino. Pretty brave move, really, by the new world champion. A lot of people had his name down as somewhat of a surprise winner. But coming to the front in a race like the Tour of Lombardy and showing off his World Championships jersey just goes to show that he is a man that we will see an awful lot of in the future. And let's not forget, Phil, he's only 23 years old. And he might do well to remember, too, that Oscar Kamazindu was a, something of a surprise winner himself for the world title last year, then won this event and hopes to defend that title today. The climb here was 962 metres high, a real tester. Pascal Richard was an early attacker when we went over the climb of the Madonna del Gisalo, but since then he was reeled in. There's the gap at the moment. Uh, one rider chasing at 41 seconds and then the main field down to only 50 men. They were a little further back at 52 seconds. These two riders really acting as a carrot with such a long way still to go towards the finish and Barbaro willing to work with the new world champion. I think Paul possibly a sure bravado here by Oscar Frere because since he won the world title he's found the pro sport a little bit tough. Very difficult indeed, he's hardly slept at all at night, several solicitations and, and still a lot of no negotiations going on about where he's going to actually race for next year because now his uh, contract wasn't uh, negotiated with Vitaligo Siguros, they were trying to sign him up before the start of the World Championships but he must have known exactly what was in the back of his mind because he didn't want to sign anything till after the Worlds, pretty sensible move. Well, yes, as it turns out, because remember, that was only his 12th day of cycling under competition this year, and he landed the world title. Well, looking here now at uh, Barbaro, a rider who turned pro back in 1993 for Mercatoni Uno, and uh, his best performance ever, second in the Grand Prix of Zurich uh, this year, so he's on a bit of form, and he's got himself three wins so far in the pro scene. An exceptional rider, Barbaro, very aggressive. Going out on a move like this really is uh, showing yourself off to the Italian crowds because uh, this is the final race of the year for the Italians. It is a major event and I don't think this was really a, a breakaway that anyone thought was ever going to succeed. But certainly it has put a lot of pressure on the rest of the field. The first hour of racing at 43 kilometers an hour will have a lot of riders with heavy legs going into the last hour and a half of racing. Well, this climb here of Salvino is the first of a number of climbs. This one, as you can see, takes us up to 962 metres. Then we've got three in quick succession, the climb of the Older and the Forkella di Barra, uh, also in excess of 700, km, 700 metres rather, of climbing. And uh, these are tempting the other riders to come out and play, I think. In that chase group is the defending champion, or the defending leader of the World Cup, Andre Schmil. Remember, he's on a one-on-one -on -one battle today with Michael Bogert, who finished second in this race last year. Bogert needs to win, and Schmil finishing no worse than fourth if he's going to run out for the first time the winner of the World Cup. Uh, the man not starting poor, rather sadly, after his accident in the World Championships, uh, Frankie Vandenbroeke. Yeah, shame, because Vandenbroek was looking a, a really good rider for the end of the season here with a couple of stage victories in the recent Tour of Spain and a great performance at the World Championships when you think he finished up there in the top ten with a cracked scaphoid, a small bone in his, uh, in his hand. So a shame not to see him here riding because he could really have put the cat amongst the pigeons on a course like this because this is certainly the sort of course that would have suited him. But it'll be a big ride today by Andre Schmiel because this is one of the classics that Andre Schmiel has never really enjoyed. He's not a great climber, he's never been very good in races like Liege, Baston Liege, but today he has to mark the Rabobank leader Michael Bogart if he's going to win the World Cup for the first time. Well, we may be looking at the world champion on this midway climb, but as you see, the gap now down to 30 seconds. And behind in that group is also Jan Ulrich, who's finishing his year with a flourish. And what a strange season it has been, but everybody riding well now have all had sort of part seasons. I mean, Frere here had an accident back in February, 
and has only had 12 days of racing until the World Championship happened for him. And Ulrich also ha had an accident in the Tour of Germany. Van den Brucker had a midway hiatus with his doping problems with uh, Cofidis. And uh, it seems that you can't ride a full season anymore. This is now the descent, and it looks as though they're very cautious coming down. This is the thing about the descents here in northern Italy. They're very twisty, and they're extremely narrow. And in fact, look at that. But in fact, we've seen the crash there, the Barbaro. He really did take a nasty tumble. Let's look at that again. As he comes into the corner there, you see he's just starting to lean down a little bit. The front wheel goes from underneath his machine and he comes down with a pretty hard crash. That is the difficult thing about the Tour of Lombardy because we're in very small mountain roads and as you come down a descent, even on this descent we, we're on now at the moment, you can see in fact that the road is partially wet and partially dry and that's what causes the major problems. Well, we're looking here at uh, Manzolini at the front of this group here from Seiko. This is on the way down. Uh, not far behind, this is now developing into a little chase group here, approaching the same bend as where Barbaro just crashed. Barbaro has lost his position at the front because of it. Plenty of telecom riders down there, but in this main uh, uh, field of some 30 riders or so here, it's a one-on-one -on -one battle between two teams, Paul, as well, and it's probably going to help the battle between uh, Schmill and um, Bogert, because Mappe are locked in a one-on-one -on -one battle with uh, Rabobank, and either one could carry off the World Cup team award. It's making it very complicated for the last World Cup race of the year because everybody's got a reason to ride at the front. Rabobank really do have the major pressure on themselves though. So that was the situation, we're now picking up the action here, the riders are still on the descent, Paul taking a very cautious way down, but this is now an attack by the local man who lived and trained on these roads, a Celestino, and what a great season this man is having, winner of a World Cup Classic this year in Germany, almost clipping those road sign boards on the way down. He's trying to get away and I think his lead, with some 42 kilometres to go to the finish, is about 30 seconds. A very brave move by Celestino, but the Polti team having a pretty good end of the season as well. This young man really did come to form later in the year after the Tour de France when he won the Hugh Classic, and he is at the moment trying to build up a massive lead. It is hovering around about the 30-second mark, and there are several groups trying to get across to him. Pascal Richard is one of the guys trying to get across, and this man, Phil, I have to say, is a remarkable performer. He's the reigning Olympic champion, and in fact, he's managed to have himself a, a jersey designed with the Olympic rings on. He's not, uh, I think, in the greatest form of his life, but certainly he's a rider who can always come up with a good performance. He's a very surprising rider indeed, and he's out of a team sponsor at the end of this year, so maybe that's why he's on the attack today. He's had a 1-2-3 over the years in this Tour of Lombardy, so he knows all about the podium positions, and it looks as though he's trying to draw other people out to play at the moment, and the attacks are starting to come again. Mappe now beginning to move forward. At the front of that, that bunch, though, you could see an awful lot of orange jerseys. That's all the troop of Michael Boga trying to protect the man. He has to finish first or second in this race if he's going to win the World Cup and take it away from Andre Schmiel. But Schmiel will do the best that he can to stay as close in contact as possible with the man who is his closest challenger. Well, I think everywhere the map they go today, they're going to find themselves followed by a Rabobank rider, and who knows, they might take advantage of this, 30 kilometres to go now, and this is still uh, Celestino on the front, and he'll be cheered all the way here because he's known by just about everybody at Bergamo. He trains on the roads here, let's not forget either, Paul, this is the headquarters of the Palti sponsorship too. It's also an area where a lot of the Italian cyclists live. But you can see all the motorbikes are being moved out of the way. That must mean that the group that has been forming behind may, may soon be coming across to this lone leader. Well, let's have a look who we've got here, because this is uh, Daniel De Luca sitting at the front here. And I think Pascal Richard must have been swept up there and might well be in that group. The Seiko rider is certainly Eddie Manzolini, and we'll see who comes up. Well, that's a good move here. This is a very difficult part of the course and still 30 kilometres left to go to the finish. It is a long way to the finish line here in the Tour of Lombardy, I have to say, because there is no flat land now between here and the finish in Bergamo. It's all up and down, all undulating like this and on small roads. Oscar Kamazin is the other rider who's got into that group, so four riders chasing, but the main field fill are still not very far behind. It's real touch and go, but anybody still in contention has had to work for it today. This has been a very, very fast race indeed. Conditions have been pretty good for the time of the year here in northern Italy. And the riders have really cracked under the effort today. There's only about 30 riders left in serious contention. 
There's Manzolini, another one of the young up-and-comers from Seiko. And on the and they picked up Celestino now, so Americo back in the pack. He's done very well this year with two good wins. He won the Copper Plaque uh, in September as well, which is a nice warm-up race for the last few races of October. And this uh, group getting itself organised now. Good move by Pascal Richard. He launched the attack at the time when he felt certain that their break was going to go off the front, and he did get picked up by the counter-attack, and what's happened is he's managed to get himself now into the leading group of five riders. The main field is still only 20 seconds behind at the moment, and a lot of riders trying to get clear. So let's have a look at who we've got then. Eddie Mazzolini from Seiko is here. Oscar Kamazind, and looking good now to possibly defend the title he won last year for Switzerland. This is one of those races, Paul, where the Italians haven't had much luck this last decade. They've only won it twice. It's a difficult race to get really up for at the end of the season. That looks like Dmitry Konishev there at the front of the main field. And Jan Ulrich also very, very present at the front of the bunch there. Well, Ulrich is the man on form, and there is the leader of the World Cup, and looking good at the moment, because everywhere Michael Bogert has gone, Andre Schmil has followed. Schmil quite happy to sacrifice any hope of a victory here, because the closer he moves to the win, and he takes Bogart with him, the closer he moves to losing his grip on the World Cup. So he will just be relieved if a group stays away all day. You see that Pascal Richard in the white uh, Olympic banded jersey there, sitting at the back, He's a very dangerous rider when he gets into a breakaway situation like this because you'll see he'll let the younger riders in the group here do a lot of the work, making sure that this breakaway stays clear. The main field still hasn't given up, though, because they're still hovering around about that 30-second mark. But if it comes down to a sprint, one man you really must take care of is the man there wearing number 131, Pascal Richard, because he always seems to come up with the right tactics towards the end of a race like this. This man has had so many great performances, and uh, when you're least expecting it, nobody dreamt he would land the first Olympic Open road race championship in Atlanta, yet up he popped and took that. We've seen him snatch great stage wins in the Tour de France, all against the odds. He reads the race so well and somehow seems to be able to land the wins when you don't feel he's showing top form. He's had a pretty rough time since he won the Olympic championship, but he's still trying to uh, hold his place in the pro peloton right now. But he rode a good Tour of Lombardy last year because, in fact, he finished fifth in the Tour of Lombardy last year. So he is a man who gets psyched up for specific rendezvous throughout the season. And he always manages to build himself up for one big day throughout a year. And that's what he did in 1996 when he had a fantastic season, not only winning Liege, Baston Liege, but going on to take that first Olympic title you were talking about. Such a long time since I remember watching him win the World Cycle Cross Championship back in 1988 when he was sponsored by Weinmann. Uh, the brake company making its first steps into sports sponsorship and they got off to a great start with Pascal at the time uh, because right out at the start of their new season they had a world champion on the team. He's a most interesting character. Here's the, what's left of the Tour of Lombardy and uh, just living in hope that they might see the front again. They're not that far behind actually but these days I think 45 seconds on these roads could be seen as a long way. Great performance here by Andre Schmiel because normally by this time of the season, Schmiel is not really competitive anymore. He really axes his whole season on the early season classics, the Paris Roubaix and the Tour of Flanders. So to see him riding in this group of 30 riders, chasing the leading group of five at the moment, just goes to show that he's really dosed out his season this year and he's managed to keep himself on form. And really, I think if he can just keep in contact with Michael Bogart, he's going to get himself that first win in the World Cup, a title that he's been so very close to over the last couple of years. But it looks as if these five guys at the front are in danger now because the uh, last time check we got there was 22 seconds back to the next group. Yeah, it's not much at all, and they've still got a few undulations to go as well as we head through here, some 28 kilometres from the finish. And remember that Schmil, Ulrich, Bogart are driving that race behind. I would think less so Schmil, uh, but also the battle between the Rabos and the Mappe boys is at its height now. This is the final round of the World Cup, an event which has seen Schmil take out the Milan San Remo at the start of the year to get an early lead. He conceded the lead, he's got it back now, and the only man that can touch him with the non-starting of Frank van der Broek today is uh, Michael Boger. so he's going to try and shut him out, I think. You can see on the front there again the Mercatoni Uno rider, as Dimitri Konishev trying to get clear, taking a few risks on this descent to try and split up the group, hoping that somebody's going to just leave the gap as they go around the corner. And in fact, you can see he is starting to splinter three or four riders off the front of the group there. Well, this is their last chance, I think, to get across these leaders because these leaders aren't going to wait for them. They're working very well together. 
Remember, Oscar Kamazin knows the roads. He put his attack in towards the end last year and got away to a victory. A man that had won virtually nothing suddenly pops up with the World Championship and the Tour of Lombardy in a matter of days. And all of a sudden, his career had turned around. Same could be said this year for Oscar Freer. Uh, but right now, Oscar is out of it. He's made his move. He's been seen in front of the television cameras for half the day. But he's now dropped back and through the field as far as we know. 20 seconds now back to that leading group which is the, the next group which is in fact being led down the descent by Dmitry Konishev taking an awful lot of risks but you can see Pascal Richard on the back of this group of five riders here he's letting everybody else do the pacemaking he's obviously not really in super condition at the moment but he's using his brain he's just letting the other guys set the pace he's doing enough to keep on the back of the leading group of five and just hoping that they can stay clear to the finish because then he'll be able to unleash a pretty good sprint and it is a very difficult sprint at the end of Tour of Lombardy as well because now there's a, a little corner with around about 250 300 meters to go and if you can get around the front there in first or second position you've got an ideal chance at winning the race just wondering why uh, medical celestino is hanging on the back there whether he's planning another little move or whether he's beginning to suffer if you remember if you managed to see the hamburg uh, world cup event the hughes cup uh, Celestino really caught them napping on the running. They all watched one another. He jumped away, and there he was, the winner of the World Cup. And now, like all of these surprise winners, they get that little confidence booster, and he's now part very much of the action. And now here's the battle behind me. Sorensen involved as well. This is the, the Mappe versus the Rabobank. It looks as though they're trying to get Bogart backed up to the front here. Well, they realise now Bogart has to win this event or finish second if he's going to win the World Cup this year. That's why Rolf Sorensen has come to the front now to put the hammer down. The group of five riders, they can almost see them in the big long straights. And Sorensen, a very canny rider, using every opportunity he can to try and get close up behind the, the TV motorbike there just to get a little bit more of a slipstream as the motorbike tries to accelerate to keep out of his way. But this is real speed at the moment. We're touching 60 kilometres an hour on this road here. And you can see the urgency coming into the pedal action of Rolf Sorensen. In fact, the power has dragged him off the front of that group of 24 riders. Absolutely superb riding by the aging Rolf. Uh, he's a man that's known the great victories uh, in big races like the age best on the age. Perhaps one of his saddest memories was crashing out of the Tour de France and wearing the yellow jersey. But now you see he's acting as a super domestique here and he's driving on. And also the Mercatoni Uno boys are also contributing to this pace too putting a lot of pressure on at the front, which is a little bit strange because they've got a man in the leading group, so I'm not quite sure why they would be doing that. But Sorensen, you can see, certainly believes he's got a chance of getting off the front. He's gritting his teeth there, but in fact, there is a reaction from the group and more riders starting to get up. And this is causing a serious split in that group of chasing riders, which the last count we had was made up of 24 riders. Sorensen has decided this is the moment to go for it. I've got to pull that leading group back of five, and I can only hope that Michael Bogard is following me. You see, he keeps keeps looking over his shoulder there to see the position of Michael Bogart in this group. Well, as far as we know, he's in there, but there's the gap we can see now from the helicopter, and we've got something like eight or nine riders here uh, trying to get clear, being driven on. And in that group is Andre Schmiller as well, Paul, so it looks as though the big two are clear. Well, Andre Schmiel has got himself in there, and I thought I caught a glimpse there of Michael Bogart as well. Those two riders riding very close together in this event, but there are still an awful lot of orange jerseys there, and we're only around about 15 seconds between this group and the leading group of five, so it may all come back together. This looks like Jan Ulrich now putting in the yep. big power attack. A great end of the season to him with that victory in the Tour of Spain, a world championship title in the individual time trial coming after his win in 1993 in the amateur event. So he, too, is looking to get himself a big classic victory. Well, the fat boy is now back in the big time and looking at just like he did a couple of years ago. He sits on that bike and he just powers those big legs and there's very few can hold on with him. He's caused the reaction, though, and just by that turn of speed, he shut down that attack by Rolf Sorensen. And somebody now has tried to get away off the front here. And it looks to me as though we've got the Mappe boys. This is one-on-one -on -one now, Paul, the Mappe versus Rabobank. Looks like Daniel Nardello trying to get across there. He putting the pressure on. It is a big, important battle for Rabobank and Mappe to be the, uh, the winner of the team prize. This is Michael Bogard there putting his arm up, trying to get some help from his teammates, trying to get everybody to the front. He wants to try and win this event or finished at least second, and that way he would rob the victory away from Andre Schmiel, the man who's led this competition for an awful long time. 
There's the breakaway being charged forward by Eddie Mazzolini for Seiko. Good colours, those are television commentator, aren't they? Bright red, we can't miss them. And looks as though Konishev here at the front of this little chase group, and it's just 18 seconds, so they're far from safe. Very far from safe. There's big major pressure on the front of that group. They're trying to pull themselves back to the leading group in five as they come round this corner. They will certainly be able to see the neutral service car behind them because the leading group of five have only got one car behind them now. All the motorbikes have been cleared out, and there's the, the chasing group coming around the corner. Very prominent at the front in the orange and white of the Rabobank team there is Rolf Sorensen looking for his teammate, and they have caused a split here, and in fact, a great move by Andre Schmiel, who's managed to get himself into that front split. Well, it looks to me to be about nine riders. Uh, it's been caused in the end by uh, Dmitry Konishev, the rider who I think is retiring this year, but he's hinting he may not do so now. Concentrating on a good ride in the World Championships. He was in at the kill, but he wasn't able to produce the finish required to take the world title. But he did have a good World Championships, and that came on the back of a very good and solid Tour de France where he won the stage as well. A unique rider, Dmitry Konishev, first Soviet man ever to lead the King of the Mountains in the Tour de France and to get a medal at World Championship professional level. So he's had a terrific career and, of course, owes Italy for his wife as well. An interesting move here now because uh, always at the front of this group there's a big acceleration coming from Rolf Sorensen trying to pull back that leading group of five riders. They're now really surviving if they can, hoping they can hold on to the last few seconds that they've managed to build up. They've never had more than 45 seconds advantage over this chasing group, and you can just see them there, led here by De Luca, the winner of the Hughes Classic in Germany this year in Hamburg, Eddie Mazzolini in the red and white for Seiko, Oscar Kamen's in going through there, Mirko Celestino and Pascal Richard. Richard just his round shoulders over the front of that bike, but he's up against some good youngsters now. De Luca won the baby Giro in his last year as, a, as an amateur. He's now a first year as a pro and beginning to look extremely good as well, settling in nicely. Some good youngsters coming through now. Mazzolini, not quite as young as De Luca. He's now some 26 years of age, uh, but even so, chance to get a good performance on the board here. He needs one this year, actually. He hasn't got any wins at all. And Oscar Kamazin, too, is the defending champion of the Tour of Lombardy. You can see the fact that he's wearing number one as last year's winner of this event. And he's a very canny rider when it comes down to the final day, the final few kilometres of a classic like this. These little lumps on the run into Bergamo are very heavy on the legs after a race at this time of the season of 262 kilometres. And it feels as if these small inclines turning into great big mountains. Very typical scene in autumn as we look around. They used to call this the race of the falling leaves or the tour of autumn. Either is quite applicable at this time of the year. Carrying number one there, last year's winner, putting up a number one display as well in this group because this has not been an easy breakaway. There they are, right up there now behind him. I think that's Paolo Bettini, Paul, who's trying to get across the gap, but they're all there and uh, they're right on them, snapping at the heels. What a great finale this is turning out to be very close it's all coming down to the last few kilometers watch out for Jan Ulrich though because you can see the way he's, he's pedaling there Phil he's got serious power at the end of this season after a great tour of Spain a very good world championships and there's the leading group of five they can almost reach out and touch them now and still as always in fifth position there in the white jersey Pascal Richard is just hoping now that these guys stay clear because then he will unleash a pretty nasty sprint Oscar Kamazin, what a great year he's had really as a world champion. He's been in the thick of the action ever since he first turned up in the Tour Down Under in Australia, that first race of the season, and he was tailed off on the road race stages, always finishing in small groups behind the leading pack, in fact. But he found his form as the year went on. He had a very competitive big period in the stage races. Hasn't won many races, but then as world champion, you very rarely do. But now look at this for a good finish. There he is, number one. Conscious of the fact they're being chased down very rapidly by this group behind, yet still willing to work hard here. And Pascal Richard just looking for a result that might give him a contract for another year of racing next year. Well, this is looking very good for the Italians at the moment. As you said earlier, the Italians have not been too successful over the last few years in the Tour of Lombardy. 
and today there are three riders in the leading group of five up against two Swiss riders. Oscar Kamen's in obviously the biggest favourite of the two Swiss riders in the group, but you always have to beware of Pascal Richard because he sometimes comes up trumps when you least expect it. He does, though, at the moment, Phil, look to me as if he's suffering a bit because, in fact, although he's been sitting at the back of the group, he has, in fact, been losing a little bit of uh, distance on these slight accelerations on the uphill parts. Well, I'm not surprised because the 1993 winner of this event, he, he broke away at around 60 kilometres covered today and he was clear on the climb of the Madonna del Gisalo, that cycling uh, mecca at the start early on in the race. Then they reeled him in by 152 kilometres. The race had totally regrouped those that were still strong enough, that is. And then the attacks came again, starting by Barbado and Oscar Freire, the world champion. And yet to think that Oscar, that uh, rather Pascal Richard, is still in the action coming into these closing kilometres says a lot for the man. Yeah, bear in mind as well, he's one of the oldest riders in the bike race this afternoon. He's almost 36 years of age. And look at that, Phil. There is the group with all the big favourites, and they still haven't managed to nail down what is only a 10-second gap. Another attack coming here from Mercatoni Uno. It looks like it might be Konishev trying to get across again. Here's uh, a look back at how we probably saw that attack go, and it goes on the far right of the, of the picture here. And uh, hitting them at a time when the race is under pressure, and I'm not too sure whether there's anybody left with the legs to go with him. Pressure on in the front as well. These riders just hoping to survive. They've held on to a 10-second advantage here. Rabobank don't want anybody to slip off the front at the moment. They're nailing it down. The reason they're trying to nail it down there is because Daniel Nardello managed to get himself into that leading group. And again, well up there, Rolf Sorensen, urgently trying to get himself into a situation today. You see, this is the situation, because when riders go clear like this, uh, and they're Mape, then they're being hunted down by the Rabobank. And when the Rabobank counter the move, it is the Mape who chase them down. And all this cat and mouse tactics is going on, and the, the little group up front, which they can see half the time, is coming no closer. And there they are. They could be profiting here from this one-on-one -on -one battle of the two big teams. Still all five riders riding at the front there, sharing the pacemaking, realising this is a possibility of survival. There's a possibility this group may well stay clear to the finish because you're right, Phil. What's happening in this group now is it's each man is attacking on his own. There's no organised chase in this group here with all the big leaders. Everybody wants to get across that gap to the leading group of five on his own, but he doesn't want to take anybody with him. So what's happening in this group, it's accelerating, it's decelerating, and they don't have a constant speed like the leading group of five who are all working nicely together. And there's the little white jersey of Schmill watching all of the gunfire going off around him and taking no part in it. The only time he'll move is when Michael Bogert goes on the attack because as long as he shuts Bogert out of the top two finishing positions today, he's won the World Cup and that must be a great feeling at this stage of the race. Pretty impressive ride there by Christophe Moreau, the Festina rider just going out of the picture. He's done a great performance to be up there at the kill of a race today like the Tour of Lombardy, which as you can see by the fact that there aren't very many riders left in towards the end of this 262 kilometer race, it has been a very hard day in the saddle. But the last head count, Paul, there was only 30 guys left in with a shout here. This field has got slowly but surely smaller because of the constant attacks. Look at that split again, and they're clawing their way back in to make this compact chase group. It really is tough out there at the moment. It's been a very, very good last few kilometres. This is the man that's hoping to get himself victory today, Michael Bogard. A great performance in the last part of the season. He really was a man who was hoping to win the Tour de France this year. He had serious bad luck in the opening week of the Tour, and he just fell to pieces. He then tried to build himself up for a victory at Alpe d'Huez, but it wasn't going to be his Tour de France this year. But he certainly come back with a good end of season, and a win today would give him the win in the World Cup. And that he would have to take off this man here wearing 104, the, the former Russian, the former Moldovian, and yeah. now a Belgian, who lives just around the corner from here by the Lago di Gardi. That's absolutely right. So uh, a full international cyclist, I think we'll call uh, André Schmilt. But if you remember back to the start of the Tour de France at the Puy de Foucault, when uh, Michael Bogart came into the medical control centre when we were there, he looked so fit and really awesome. I really thought he was going to win the Tour de France. But it just goes to show uh, one or two things can really get to a rider. And at the, the fact that he got caught up in that crash on the yeah. very difficult stage over the Passage au Bois, it just, he went to pieces after that. He saw the Tour de France get lost. He saw that he lost six and a half minutes and just uh, he gave up, unlike Alex Zuller, who fought his way back to finish second after being involved in the same accident. Yeah. 
Now, the things go wrong, as we know, otherwise the sport wouldn't be exciting for us to commentate on it, but we don't wish anybody bad luck. And right now, Bogart, I think, must be feeling his chance of resting the World Cup lead away on this last event from Schmill are going through the window because these riders attack and counter-attack and they're still hovering at around about 20 seconds. Well, in fact, it stretched out to 20 seconds there because it had come down to just eight seconds. But you can see the five leaders are still working well. They've never laid down arms. Even when looking over their shoulders, they could see that the group was right behind them. Six kilometres to go. And I reckon now they've got a pretty serious chance because there's nobody organising the chase behind. Well, we're two kilometres. Uh, from the climb, the last climb of the race, and then you've got a couple of kilometres down to the finish. This is the climb up to Bergamo itself, and this was where, in fact, Kamazind attacked last year and went on to win the race. He's in the breakaway, he's got his shot at the gold medal again, that's him, slipped to the back of the group now, that might be significant. And Pascal Richard, the grand old man of world cycling, but also one of the craftiest, has slipped to last position. He might be scheming as well. He might be scheming, he might also just be hoping that he can survive over the next part of this course once they do start that climb, because he looks to me as if he's in difficulty. He looks as if he's just going to try and survive over this climb, and you can see, I think now what's going to happen with Rabobank, they're going to try and plan something, because they're now coming to a part of the terrain where they can put Andre Schmiel for the last time this year into difficulty, and this is where they have to come up with a big operation if they're going to try and get the win for Michael Bogard. But let's not forget, they've still got five guys in front who are still holding on to a 20-second advantage. Advantage. And there's a whole flotilla of Mbappe boys down there, including Johan Museu. I spotted him down in that group as well. He's another great man of cycling, come back this year after that terrible crash in Paris-Roubaix last year. And for my money, still one of the best bike riders on the circuit. Now, onto the climb, and it looks as though Kamazin is going to try and stretch Celestino and De Luca here. Kamazin is setting the pace, but we wouldn't call this an attack, Paul. It's not the pace that he had last year. It's not the acceleration. You see that Pascal Richard was actually going off the back of the group there. This is Mirko Celestino. Look at the face on him. He's really looking concentrated on this part of the game. He's trying to keep the pressure on, but they haven't managed to split the group, although I do think, in fact, Richard has managed to recover and come back with 24 seconds now, so they've extended their lead over the chasers. Five riders still clear, and they've been able to touch these riders for the last 20 kilometres and not reach them. Now, this is Konishev here, and he's coming across the gap and looking very strong indeed. He's pulling somebody with him there. This is a difficult part of the course here, coming into the uh, outskirts of Bergamo, through the cobblestones, flicked through the, the archway there, and that was a great move by... The man behind from Russia, Dmitry Konishev, he's halfway across the gap. But look at this, Pascal Richard now on the cobblestones, trying to survive, trying to keep as big a gear as possible rolling, but he just doesn't have the acceleration left in his legs, Phil. Well, 259 kilometres in those legs as well now. They're being battered on the cobblestones here of the Colle Aperto. And this is De Luca, third when he rode the last under-23 World Championship last year, now had his sampling his first full season as a pro and he's ridden extremely well but this is going to go down as his best ride of the year whatever he finishes and he's right in with a chance of winning this and what a finish to the season that would be Kamazin might have other ideas look at the Tifosi here enjoying this now Pascal Richard he kicks again when he sees the crowd shouting at him uh, but I think that's it I think he's gone what a man though he knew what he had to do he's keeping himself as much as possible in contact he's backing off a little bit when he feels in difficulty and there's again an attack coming from Kamazin he knows the top of the climb is in sight Mazzolini straight onto his wheel and there in third position is De Luca and now Celestino also is in difficulty on this climb just can't quite hold on to the wheel well he knows the climb he should do he's trained up it many times remember the Polti are also based here he's going to feel a lot of pressure from that but I think it's uh, the long day has told on him here. Remember, he was the man that started the breakaway at circa 43 kilometres from the finish. And now Kamazin has gambled everything on this. What a great defence of his win from last year in any case. A great move as well. In fact, a couple of riders disappearing from the leading group. Celestino has gone, as has Pascal Richard. But I just caught a glimpse there, Phil, of Dmitry Konishev coming across the gap. Well, he'll do well to get across again, Paul, because the pressure really on now. These three are trying to break up this leading group. Remember, everybody else is not that far behind either. Cameras in going again on the far right. We come up towards the kilometre to go now, and this one is the serious one. 
This is a good move. He's giving it everything now. He's got to put distance between himself and the other guys. Mazzolini's coming back. De Luca is coming back as well. And he hasn't managed to get rid of the other two guys that were with him. Now three riders at the, in the lead. Celestino is somewhere behind, as is Konishev now. And Pascal Richard has disappeared from the action. And just look at the youngster here, Danilo De Luca, because this for him will be the best performance of his first full season as a pro. And he's not going to give up easy here. He's had to dig very deep to answer that attack by Kamazind. Mazzolini did it, and now De Luca has done it, and we've got these three clear. This is Konishev. Konishev and Celestino. Celestino's been caught by Konishev, and look at the speed of Celestino. He's giving it everything now. He knows this is his last chance to get onto the leading group of three because once they get into the town, it's a very sharp left hand bend, and they're in the finishing straight. Well, this is a beautiful finish now of the Tour of Lombardy here in Bergamo. And these riders are trying to get victory for the Italians. They've not had a lot of success over the last decade in this event, but now it looks certain for a victory, unless, of course, Kamazin spoils it, or indeed Konishev, if he can get on. The, gap, the distance behind is five seconds at the moment. De Luca looking over his shoulder. These guys know that if they start playing cat and mouse ah. now, in fact, they are playing cat and mouse behind, Konishev is not working hard enough for Mirko Celestino, and at this pace, they're not going to make it. But in fairness, I'm not sure there's much left in those legs for Konishev now. He's chased very hard to get across. Celestino was the rider who was up there, has fallen back and still trying to get across. He's riding, don't forget, as an inspired man today, that's for sure. Now the twisting descent away from the Alto as we head towards the finish now in Bergamo itself. This is tricky now as we come into the streets of Bergamo. Any of these corners are very dangerous, especially after a long day in the saddle. This is the moment now that they're trying to decide who's going to launch the attack. Mazzolini's gone down the outside. De Luca's taking up the chase, and the experienced Kamenzin takes up third position. Just a little bit off the wheel, though. Well, Kamazin, recently the ex-world champion, winner of this race in the rainbow jersey last year, now trying to repeat his victory. There aren't many who have done that. He rides number one and clearly he too is inspired. But this is a good attack here by De Luca and Mazzolini. One kilometre to go, so it must have been two when they came over that hill. Well, Mazzolini put a, a fine attack in there, but as they go around the corner, the leading group of three comes all back together. Inside the last kilometre now, now's the time when you can't mess around. Now's the time when you've got to go for it and decide how you're going to lead out the sprint. These guys now are deciding who's going to lead the sprint out now. There shouldn't be any more late attacks. Kamen's in looking over his shoulder to see what the position is of Konishev and Celestino. Well, he's going to leave his sprint as late as he possibly can here as he sits at the back. But look under the trees there because that's the other two. And that'll be Celestino and uh, Konishev. And it looks if these three mess about, those two will be on. This reminds me of a finishing of Liège Baston Liège a few years back when uh, Argentina spoilt the party for Roach and Claude Cricillion. Well, they've still got to make the junction. They're still a little way off the leading group of three, but Celestino has made the effort. He's made it to the front, but there's the rest of the group as well. They're not going to catch the five leaders. Celestino leads them into the corner. So Celestino from nowhere to the front, and the adrenaline still flowing, has found himself in the lead here. Konishev has got on, but is sitting at the back, and this is going to be a turn-up. The Pulte man is going to steal this on the line as Konishev sits up and thinks what might have been Celestino just takes it on the line from Danilo De Luca. What a great performance. Konishev didn't have it left in his legs at the end. He came across the line in fifth place there, and the group's right on the line now. And here's the sprint now for the placings behind, and it looks as though Zaberg, the big sprinter, finishing it off nicely there, Marcus Zaberg for Rabobank. And it'll depend on the order of the Rabobanks over the line there, whether they've done enough to take the World Cup away from the Map 18. What a great sprint here. Marco Celestino got on right at the last minute here, but a last-minute lunge there by De Luca almost gave victory to him as well. It was so close on the line, and 1-2-3 for the Italians. Well, uh, the little De Luca will be uh, unhappy there because he's lost it by a whisker, but he gets uh, second place anyway, and that's a fantastic result for him. Look at this now. It really was close, wasn't it? Celestino, though, nothing lucky about that win. He gets on just inside of the finish and kept the adrenaline flowing and sprinted all of the way to the line. Mazzolini gets the third place. That's his finest ever finish in a World Cup event. And Oscar Camazzi in the good defence of his crown won last year fourth. And uh, he also finished sixth in the World Championships where he had won that title too a year ago. So I think both events for him uh, have gone pretty well at this close of season. Certainly a brilliant move there by 
Celestino coming up, not, wait, not waiting a moment before he came by and accelerated through to the finish. Congratulations all round. A nice home win for Palti in Bergamo, home of the sponsors, and uh, all ready to, no doubt, uh, congratulate Celestino when he comes off the winner's podium. His time of 6 hours 21 minutes and 50 seconds, an average speed for the 262 kilometres of 41 kilometres an hour. So a very quick race indeed. And we can confirm not only has André Schmil won the World Cup, uh, finishing ahead of Michael Bogart, but by five points, Rabobank are the World Cup champions as well. And there's the result of De Luca Mazzolino comes in, and the main field led home by Marcus Zeberg, 11 seconds down. There's the World Cup winner, 299 points amassed since his victory at the start of the season in Milan San Remo. Andre Schmil, having been placed in the World Cup before, is now the World Cup holder for next season. Bogart second and Frankie van der Broek a non-starter today third. I hope you enjoyed the coverage of the 93rd Tour of Lombardy. For Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying see you next season. Goodbye.